So is this working? All right, so um, it's time for lunch, but unfortunately, lunch is not ready yet. So um, you have to hear me out. I'm going to talk to you through a story. It's, uh, it's about scaling. So it's not about having lots of teams doing one product. It's, about, uh, it's not about lots of teams doing various products. It's about doing lots of teams developing one product. So um, the former one is a bit easier. So and it's about Thales. And Thales is a, is a company that um, um, has over 70,000 people. It does a lot of stuff on, um, in aerospace and in defense. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, the division that works with defense. So a customer would be the Department of Defense of Portugal. That would be a customer. And they would want to have uh, stuff. For example, they would, ha would like to have a, a, um, a radar. For example, the radar uh, uh, on the uh, right bottom there. Um, if you actually fire a missile from Porto, we would know within three seconds in Holland that you fired the missile. So that kind of stuff is uh, the products that we are making. And it's not, uh, so it's not your average internet uh, thingy. Uh, another product is this one, it's the goalkeeper. It's a bit more violent. Um, um, it's also the radar that is being developed there. And this one is, is it's on a boat, on a warship, for example. And when all, all other defenses uh, were insufficient and the missile, for example, is still coming your way, then the goalkeeper gets into action. So he has a radar, he locks you, and then there is no more escaping. It has a 99.95% hit rate. And it fires 4,200 big, very big bullets a, a second. So there's no escape. So this is the context. This is the products that we, that we are developing. And I want to talk to you about how we actually implemented Agile um, at this division. Is that OK? <laughs> so a anybody doing Scrum or Agile with more than four teams developing one product? All right. So more than eight teams developing one product. More than 12 teams developing one product. There's two left. All right, more than 50 teams. So there's nobody, more than 50 teams, okay. So I don't know, do you guys know SAFE? SAFE starts at 50 teams? So I don't know if it's SAFE or not, but I'm being recorded, so I'm stopping at this point. <laughs> so okay, so, so let's, let's, let's talk, let, let, let's, let's get a little bit more context. So, um, so we're de developing systems, that means we develop electronics, so printed circuit boards, but, and we develop iron, right, stuff that to put, on, put the circuit boards in, and we develop software, and then there is uh, systems engineering, and system engineering is, is a lot of academic people doing academic stuff. So let's not go into there. So we're, pro we're focusing on software here, and um, wow, and the beamer doesn't work, so that's interesting. Um, so they should be filled in with stuff, but what I want, I want to show you is, they were, uh, before I came in, they were using projects. So they, they did agile project management. But what does that mean? That means, uh, well, we have various customers and ha having um, projects in parallel. And, and if you look at the system uh, of, a, of, a, um, of a radar, it contains of various components, software components. And of course, um, um, uh, to develop, a, to develop a, a radar, you need people from all those components in your project team, right? Otherwise, it, it won't work. And one of the things that they were having trouble with was, hey, um, if you look, for example, at, at, at the tracking component and the extraction component, th th those are very mathematical components because they have to analyze radar uh, waves that come back and then they have to dis discover, hey, is this a flock of birds or is it a drone? <laughs> is it an airplane or is it a missile? And where is it, where is it going? <laughs> Is it coming towards us? Is it, is it, is it making a, a turn? So it's very mathematical, and, it, and, and it's about um, a lot of MATLAB programming, for example, right? And then we have FPGA, so we have to actually program gates, right? And very different development stack. Then we have signal processing. That's a lot of GPU programming. Well, tens of GPUs running in parallel analyzing four DVDs of data every second. 
So very different development stacks. So these projects, they had, they were, they, they had maybe one or two people of each uh, very specialized component. And that meant when those people went on vacation, they had to call them when things go wrong. So they had a single point, a bottleneck. Furthermore, the projects actually, when they started developing, uh, maybe you have know that from experience, you develop the same solution for the same problem. So there were multiple solutions for the same problem in the same company. So they didn't want that anymore. So they changed to, what do you think they changed to? If you see, if you see this. So they changed to this that you also can see, okay. So they changed to a component team structure. They said, hey, we're doing agile, so that's interesting. We have this architecture, so let's follow the architecture. So for each component, as you saw before, they introduced a component team, a scrum team, with a, uh, that would, 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 would develop components. And, and then they had, they had management, in, uh, team management, they already had them, and they said, okay, we don't know exactly what we need to do with them. Well, um, they can become the product owners. So every component team would have their own backlog uh, developing components. And um, the, the initial problem of code duplication and the, the problem of, of the single point of bottleneck was actually solved, right? Because uh, uh, now we had a team of extraction specialists working together. So if one went, went sick, the others could cover, right? And, um, and then they, 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 they didn't do any duplicate code anymore because hey, they were in one team so they, can, they could see each, other co each other's code. So nothing like that uh, happened. But other things happened. Very b bad side effects started to happen. What do you think was a, a side effect that happened when, you, when, we, when they changed to the component teams? The, yeah, this gentleman is saying, okay, how do, how do they coordinate, right? They need to coordinate their work. That's a very interesting thing and it's actually, actually what happened. A lot of extra coordination was needed because the component teams didn't focus anymore on d developing an end-to-end -end piece of working software, so they introduce a new team to do that. It's called this integration team. And then they introduce another team to do the requirements, and they introduce another team to do the system testing, and then they introduce another team to do architecture. Right, they just, all these very interesting side effects. And, and, um, and what the, they, they use this fee model, uh, which again, the colors are not showing, and in the, this would be a fee here though, like that. And in, so what they did was they did Scrum at the bottom level. So all teams were actually very, very busy producing components, producing code. And you all know you don't want to produce any code. You want to produce the less possible lines of code ever <laughs> because code is full of bugs, right? And you have to maintain it and so on. So you, want, you don't want any code, but they were structured to produce the maximum amount of code. Another thing was, um, if, you, if you have this, this, this structure, so uh, wh wh what will happen if the backlog is ordered on value, what they, what they did, and you want to develop the, most, the top most feature, what will happen? You have to organize and, and sync the, the dependencies, right? And that's good, but then maybe, not maybe, 99% of the time, a few components, maybe six of them, can work on the, on the top feature, but the other five, four, they need to work on something of lower value. Because, yeah, they don't have to do anything. It's just they, their expertise is not needed for this feature. So they will, they will start working ahead. Because that's good, right, working ahead. And then later, uh, when the other teams get around that, lo that, low, that low feature, they need to integrate. Three months later, and then, yeah, you know what happens, right? So all these things were just, in effect, a result of this, uh, of this, um, wow, I, need, I really need different slides, or a different projector, can I <laughs> can also fix it. <laughs> so um, that, was, that was the problem. So the problem was this, just as a lot of people already mentioned today, the focus was on producing code and there was no focus on the whole product. There was no focus on value. So you can make the, the best components you want, Nobody will pay one cent for a component. That's one thing. So it's useless 
people stopped making those components. The other thing was, well, how do you measure, well, how do you measure progress on component level? Well, you don't. It doesn't say anything. It just says the component is more or less done. That was a, a big problem. And what about the, the poor project managers that were still there? Wow, they had to, well, I think this is the most valuable stuff to do. Now I have to work and run and pressure all those component teams to, to actually do their part so that I can finish my <coughs> piece of functionality. So it was an impossible task. Can you imagine that, right? They have, they have all these components here and you want something done, but you need to coordinate with all of those. So you, you, you're going to introduce new meetings <laughs> and lots of them. <laughs> what, and that's what they did. And the meetings, it, it gets even worse. The meetings were like this. This is very boring. <laughs> I don't know. So I, I, you, I took this picture, so I brought some sticky notes, but it didn't help in that, at that time. So these are all the components here, team, people work, thinking about requirements, working on uh, this very narrow scope. So that sucked. It didn't work. So, um, um, so what, did, what did we do? So when I, I came in and I said, okay, you need to do something. And the one thing that you need to do is you need to move to Scrum teams, meaning all teams should be able to deliver one customer-centric piece of functionality. It's not so hard. Just restructure your organization. And that's what, every, every, that's, that's what you need to do at every adoption that I did. You need to restructure your organization. And that means that you get less stuff. You get less meetings. You get less roles. You got less crap and less code. <laughs> And, and, and so management roles will need to change. So not managers will not need to change, but their roles will change. Some will leave. I've never did a, an adoption that management people didn't leave. So some will leave. Um, um, but the m most important two parts are, you have to create this focus on the whole product and you have to work on your engineering skills. So a lot of people just do the project management part of Scrum and so on, and then they forgot about, forget, forget about the agile engineering part and then it doesn't work. Then you just get more crap, maybe faster, <laughs> faster crap. <laughs> it doesn't work, <laughs> right? So, so this is, uh, again, a very colorful picture. Um, uh, yeah, maybe it's, I don't know. <laughs> so what do we, do? so the, the, we, the first thing we did was create a, a perfection vision. So it, you have to have a vision uh, so that you can actually uh, yeah, align, align the organization towards this. So we are talking about a department of 100 people within a context uh, of a program of 500 people. So, so just to give you the context. So you have to have a shared vision. And they were having this, various, this very beautiful V model that you uh, must know, uh, especially people from RUB or CMMI and so on. They know this very beautiful V model. And the start situation was like this, right? Some kind of scrum they were doing there. So within two years, so this is uh, the time span, it's not been three years now, we should, the first step would be to move, well, now there is a very beautiful color ranging up to here, <laughs> right? So the color is now here, but so the first step was, hey, let's increase the scope and the activities of the team every sprint. That's what we're talking about. So instead of having a focus on a file <laughs> or on a component, let's increase the focus to subsystem. In this case, a working radar chain. And let's increase the activities also. So instead of just writing code and, and doing functional testing on the component, let's increase the responsibility of this team to also do the integration testing. Right? So we are moving towards the Scrum team. You see what's happening? You increase the scope, so you increase the, custom, the product focus, and you increase the actions that they, a team has, can do. And then, if we, if we manage that, we can eliminate these teams, because we don't want any handovers to integration teams and so on, that were created because we changed to this component model. And then the next step would be, hey, now, now, now the, the, the color is up to here, we need to uh, include, uh, this, we, do, need do, we need to do the same thing on functional level, right? 
And then we, have, we, we must stop at the system tester because the system tester tests electronics and the whole system and you have to, it's very complicated because you have to hire F-16s to fly in the air and fire missiles and, and helicopters and so on. So it's very difficult to do that every 30 days. It's possible but probably expensive. Um, so that was the vision uh, that we um, uh, wanted to do and then again, oh man, this is really bad. <laughs> and then again, um, um, uh, the first thing that we did, we need to restructure the organization. So, as you can see, there are only two managers left now. Three. The head of the department, he became the PO. And there's only one PO because there's only one product. Don't have to have more POs. What product is a product owner owning in, in, in this PO? What, what is this PO owning? This is not a PO. This, this is a real PO, he owns the product. Um, so there were only two managers left. And those managers, what they did was they, as, as Loughlin talked about this morning, they, the only thing they did was work and coach on the interactions between the teams. So Loughlin talked about interactions within the team, but this is at scale, this is nine development teams, you have to, the managers worked and coached the interactions on the team. Um, and, um, that was a good thing because the line managers were just, were just in the way in the previous organizational structure. They were in the way of the teams communicating directly with the customer. They were doing PO stuff, meaning I'm going to write user stories. So what a PO doesn't write user stories, right? It's not a task of a PO to write user stories. A PO does two things, like clarification, that's one thing, and identifying where the value is. Those are the two main things that the PO do, does. Clarification, he, he does best by stories. Somebody gave a talk on stories, not by writing things down. It's the worst way to clarify th stuff. But the main topic, the main area of a product owner is identifying where the value is. And the clarification is left to the teams communicating directly with the customers. And that gentleman told us this morning, for those who were here, so that's what actually happened. Um, and we did some st stuff with values and so on, as you can see. So, um, so this had, as a result, so there were, the, we had now this, this, this hierarchy with which, which, which was very minimal. Um, we were now able to do fine-grained prioritization. So can you imagine before we had these three or four projects in parallel? If there, were a, if there were, a, were a, a resource that was bottlenecking it, you had to choose which project is it going to work on, or you, or you can choose to multitask, but then this gentleman told us if you multitask, I don't remember if you, if you, you were it, if, if you multitask. No, it was the other, that gentleman talked about multitasking. Then everything gets worse even, but you had to, so if you, the ordering w would be on project level, there's a big batch ordering. This project is more important than that project. But now that we increased the scope of the product, right, because it was now the sensor as a whole, we could prioritize more fine-grained. We could, we could say, okay, we do, put th we do this use story or this feature from this project and from that and from this one also in one sprint. And that's what we did. So we can op now optimize even across projects, right? Um, so that's, that's um, uh, how we did it, and now I'm going to talk to you about how, how does it look like. How do we do sprint then with 80 people in one sprint and so on. Is that okay? <laughs> You're looking a bit, a bit hungry. <laughs> uh, so I don't know about the colors, but let's see. So, um, so we work with, this is 19 to 80 people. Uh, so. Uh, um, this introduction of Scrum at a large scale resulted in less stuff, as I, as I mentioned. So that's a sign. If you scale Scrum and you get more stuff, something's wrong. You shouldn't get more stuff. You should get less stuff. Right? So, ah, this also, also sucks. Okay. So, <laughs> um, so this, is, this is how we do Scrum with 80 people. So there's one 
product backlog that is ordered. It is ordered across it. It maximum. It order is ordered on value across all products, right? And then we have a sprint planning with team representatives and the real PO in a big room, about 30 people. And we, it's it's in two parts. The first part is hey, what's the goal actually? Then we discuss that and select okay, which features do we need to do? So st which stories do we need to do in order to achieve the goal? And then the second part is everybody just the the, the, the team representatives just leave and go sit with other teams, other uh, scrum teams, and do sprint planning part two. So sprint planning part two is about creating that detailed plan about how to turn stories into working product. So it's, it's, two, it's, it's staged in two, in two levels. And then, um, yeah, everybody ends up, every team ends up with a sprint backlog, and then we need to synchronize every sprint. So although every, every, every team has, a, oh, uh, has its own sprint backlog, there's a thing that we, that we call a scrum of scrums, and we do that every day. And we do that in front of a big board, a big, there's a wall, I will show you the pictures, where we have the status of the nine teams doing their sprint. Okay? And then there's a daily scrum, of course, for every team. Uh, then we have two-step refinement meetings. The first one is, again, with 30 people, more or less, team representatives from each team, discovering uh, and, 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 and um, seeking which stories are top, and then they can pre-allocate the team representatives, which story they are going to do with their team. So the second step of refinement, the teams can do independently. Makes sense, what I'm saying? It's really basic scrum, so <laughs> it must make sense. And then we have a one, one sprint review because it's one product. Not nine, one. And then we have two retrospectives. Each team has a retrospective individually and then we have one overall retrospective. That's it. More or less, more or less it. Um, so, um, um, so w w how does it look like? Uh, so you don't see the colors, but again, you can imagine it. Um, so to do a, a particular feature, you probably, uh, uh, yeah, this team, uh, yeah, I can. This feature can be done by this team, but this feature has a dependency between these two teams, right? So that's that's what you do in refinement, and then you can do sprint planning. And when you do sprint planning. Team two and four sit together and do the sprint planning part two. So it's very easy. It's very simple. So this is actually uh, a real life picture of sprint planning. So these are the stuff that we're going to do. It's the most important stuff. And uh, all team representatives take pictures and then take, take that back to their teams to do sprint planning part two. Um, there's also sprint planning part two. And this, these are all the projects uh, that, you, that I talked about. And then we, uh, we use a, a game, an innovation game called um, uh, <laughs> Where's the Value? <laughs> so that we can actually uh, determine uh, uh, what the most valuable stuff to work on is at the organizational level. Because you can imagine if we have three project managers, all project managers will say, yeah, my stuff is more important. <laughs> so you have to have a game that you can actually rationalize about it and think about it. And the thing that we learned, um, 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 we already knew, but we, 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 we now saw it in, in real life. In the earlier, in the first year, to, so it took a long time to learn, um, when they started selecting um, stories and, of features, they would load all teams to 100%. And velocity was, I don't know, I remember it was 33 or something. And then they started, this is the last year, they started, not, they, they started loading the teams to leaving space open. I don't know the percentages, the exact percentage. And velocity went up. And that was good. <laughs> that was a good sign. <laughs> so it's, that, and it's strange. This was very hard for management to accept. Because, hey, that's strange. I have people, I pay them, I want them to work eight hours. Right? And I see that Joe is already sleeping. <laughs> That's, um, so this is this is uh, so there was no there were no more project managers uh, coordinating. So this is for the teams do that bottom up. This is a um, this is the the, the, the 
the, the, the Scrum of Scrum board, you can see all the features uh, on, the, on, the uh, on the left, yeah, and you can see some, some, some um, uh, how you call it, traffic lights on the right, indicating status and so on, of builds and so on. And, and on the other side, so this is a, this is a, a corridor, this is on, the, on one side is um, this picture, and on this side is that picture. And on this picture we build up during the sprint all the events that happen. So, for example, we start moving stuff and uh, working and stuff will get done and events will happen and we will track it. And if people is very, uh, one guy is very angry, he will write it down. And if something went wrong, we will write it down. And so we build up, we don't, on, we don't only uh, see progress, but we also build up the stuff that is interesting for a overall retrospective during the sprint. So that's a very powerful technique. And this is a scrum of scrums where team representatives actually join. And uh, there's no management here because there's only two and they have other things to do. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> I have nothing against management, right? I just have something about, about the role of management. It's, uh, m most companies it's a bit too much. Um, so retrospectives, this is a retrospective I, I talked about uh, with all the representatives from, from teams. Um, so it's, it's two parts, I just, teams or, or of course the teams have to have their own retrospective for team building and for developing their skills and so on. But you need to focus on overall organizational coaching also. And who's, be who's better in, 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 in solving that than the department head, the PO, and the people from the teams who actually do the work. Um, the review, so there's one review of course because there's one product and, but all, every team, there's a big room, every team comes and there are a few screens and they will show during the demo what they did. But it's always on product level, so it's just choosing, right, which team will do the demo <laughs> because it's one product. But they, they do it anyway, uh, mm -hmm. it's the market fair. And um, as I told you, uh, it's pretty bad to, um, do Agile and or Scrum without the engineering practices and these are some of the engineering practices we actually had to do. And this was also a very hard, very hard problem. And the top one is maybe the most important one to mention if you're in a situation like this. So teams that, write, that, that work on one component, they, they write the worst code. If you only work on one component, you write the, ro the worst code. You know why? Because it's your code, right? You understand it as a team, right? And though you, 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 without, as, as time passes, you don't know, you don't realize the wrong things you're, you're working. Now that we turn to feature team, there were no more owners of a component. No team was owned a component. So now I could write your, I could alter your code. Wow, it's been five years since somebody else saw your code. <laughs> and it's not good. <laughs> Right? And that's a good thing that is not good because then we will improve it. Right? You know, the quote from Martin Fowler, everybody can write code for a compiler, but only a few can write code for other people to understand. And that's a good thing. So shared code ownership means actually, as a team, you can alter and change multiple components. And that's a very important practice to, to do and it's very hard, especially because of the mathematical components that we were talking about. But that's one thing to, to focus on uh, if, uh, if you're in a situation like that. So um, what about management? So um, um, management actually uh, became part of the teams, as you can see. And this is an actual picture that I took uh, when, we've, when we did our first uh, uh, successful uh, uh, sprint that we felt really good about. So this is, this, is, this is after retrospective, so there, there are the three managers that were left and the rest are team representatives. And they did this scrum and we took this, that picture and we published it on every wall that we could in the company. And yeah, people laughed them, at them, so <laughs> but it was good. So um, results, uh, so the people are, are more engaged because they have a whole product focus. There's one product backlog, one definition of done, one increment. They, have a, they work on customer centric features, so that's more engaging. Um, now we have progress information at the feature level instead of component level, so that's better for us, for management, for stakeholders to, um, 
to uh, change direction. Quality is much better. Instead of two months testing phase, it's now a few days testing phase. Right? Um, and higher productivity. But okay, that's obvious. But the best one is this. If you scale, you actually descale. And there's a very smart gentleman that's not here. His name is Cop James Copeline, and he's always attacking me on this. But okay, it's something for later. So a wrap up, um, then we can go to lunch. Um, so be becoming a lean and agile organization is not a thing you will ever achieve. As just gentleman just said, it's about developing a learning capability. You will be forever being. You, you, that's the thing you want to want to develop in your organization. You will be forever experimenting and learning, doing scrum ban or kanban or whatever it was, and then turning back. That's good. If you change, if you keep stable, you will crystallize. You need to move. You need to do stuff, experiments, and so on. It's very important, and it's a difficult one for management to understand, and for non-management people also to understand that it's not a good idea to focus on utilization of people. You should focus on getting stuff done, getting a feature done. Um, yeah, and the rest you can't read, so I can just skip it. Um, the takeaway is, um, yeah, you can choose two things. You can choose a box with solutions in it, and there are frameworks for scaling that actually provide you a box. You, if you open the box, you will, everybody will live happily forever. Or you can take the hard, the hard way, and that's um, discovering your own path and what works in your context, doing uh, and letting the people that actually do the work discover that, who are the only ones that can actually do it. And that's the hard part, and that's uh, yeah, taking the steps, one step at a time. So um, I hope I'm still, you're still in time for lunch. <laughs> so did I speed it up enough? So, that's it. Okay, guys, I think we have a little time, five minutes, maybe ten minutes to one or two questions. Just so any, please. Okay. One or two, not ten or twenty, please. Thank you. Hello. Hi, work. Hi, my name is Antonieta. I'm here. Ah. Okay. Hello, I work uh, in a big company uh, with a lot of development teams, and we have the same problem. We now use um, Scrum a bit, <laughs> and we have uh, each team has its own sprint. We have several product owners, <laughs> uh, but only one product. Okay. Uh, and I'm trying to understand how did you manage the scheduling? Like uh, on Mondays, you start the, the big sprint. But and then on the afternoon, small ones, how did you do that? Um, so, so, the, so how do we do sp uh, coordination across teams, right? Is it still working? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So sp sp sprint planning is, so it depends on the size of the rooms that you have. So if you can fit 30 people in there, then you can do sprint planning with 30 people. But if you can only have 15 people, then the, the best thing to do is, ask representatives from the teams to join sprint planning part one. And part one is about discovering with your product owner what it is that you're going to do, what's the goal, the coming sprint. And then after that, the, 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 the representatives can take their stuff that they picked. So there's this backlog and each team picks what it wants to do, take it back to their team and do sprint planning part two, creating the sprint backlog, creating whatever it is that you do in, in your organization. So it's, it's just like normal sprint planning, only with more people. Is that more or less what you were asking? Yeah, yeah I wanted to understand how I can take this and apply it there. OK. We have, we have some difficulties. We have like uh, one, one, some teams and sprint plannings um, on one week. Uh, on, I mean, uh, this team starts Monday, then the next team starts on the other Monday, so they are they're, they're not synchronized. No. Yeah, I, I, would, I would encourage you, if you are below 12 teams, to have one sprint and delivering one 
increment, so one integrated product at the end of the sprint so that you can actually inspect where you are with development. Okay. And there's nothing, you know, everything is done. If you have all these sprints, then you actually are, are reducing the whole product focus. Yes, or, we are. Yeah. We are more component focused. Yeah, that's, that sucks. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> all right, thanks. So, so, so um, indicators on individual team level. You, you mean? Yeah. So, um, um, no. <laughs> That's a short answer. Yeah. So we only have there are there are only metrics at there are only metrics at um, nine team level. Yeah, there are only metrics at, one, at nine team level. So every team has a different velocity, if you want to know it, but our velocity is irrelevant at the team level, <laughs> right? So may, maybe, maybe we, can, we can have, maybe we can discuss at, uh, at, at lunch or something what you're trying to achieve with the metric. And then we can discuss some more details. But there's no I individual team measurement stuff. Okay. Okay, Mr. Thank you very much. All right, thank you.